Buffalo residents aren't just panicking because the Sabres are terrible. It also is because energy prices for the Buffalo area are up 200% in the last five years. And Buffalo is not the only place where you're seeing prices surge because of how AI is taxing the grid. There's a bunch of companies that have taken off in valuation and a lot of companies that are about to. And uh, we're going to cover those today on the Ultimate Show. Let's yeah, talk earnings since the favorite pastime. So, let me just say, earnings are quite high. Because their compensation goes up. Wall Street's wrong again. again. You know, we have said over and over, Joel, uh, that the uh, that if you're looking into 2026, uh, it's not going to be the price at the pump. It's going to be price at the meter is going to be the thing that decides what happens in this election. Um, and you're starting to see people start to really pick up on this. There's a big article recently from Bloomberg about how AI data centers are sending power bills soaring. And the data is pretty staggering, everybody. Right, I mean, you look at it, right, this is just a chart right here, very simply on US utility bills in terms of price per kilowatt hour. And you can see effectively, we're up just across the entire United States, we're up better than 50% in terms of what the ramp has been, up from, you know, plus or minus 12 to 13 cents to, you know, basically 17 to 18 cents. And if you look across the United States, the numbers in some places are even wilder. Um, what we're seeing here is you've got, you know, in say a company, a place like Buffalo, um, you've got eleven dollars per kilo uh, per, per megawatt hour is what it cost for a unit of power back in 2020. Now it's costing thirty three dollars a megawatt hour in Buffalo, and but that's not the only place. There are tons of places that are jumping. And Joel, I mean, we are starting to see right the idea that politicians are starting to push around data centers because of this, right? Yeah. So everyone, you know, has heard that AI data centers, right, are using up electricity like crazy. And if it's a small data center, they just plug in and they start paying the regular electric bill. But because the demand keeps increasing, given the supply the grid can handle, we're seeing prices increase. Now, big companies and the hyperscalers are, are careful to say, I'm going to need a lot more electricity than the grid can provide. So they're looking for pre-grid electricity, meaning I will self-power the data center I need. Right? OpenAI has announced that we're going to try to find self-power. We're going to find nuclear or whatever else. And by doing so, not drive up the demand for all the other power. At some point, I think the politicians are going to start separating pricing and saying, hey, wait a second, my residents are paying higher and higher electric prices. I'm supposed to regulate this. I'm going to start pushing any data center to not be allowed to get electricity right off the grid. And they're going to have to get pre-grid electricity on their own, which is going to drive some phenomenal growth into new sources of electrical power at some point because it's going to have to come at some point because people are going to start complaining big time that my electrical bill is just getting too high and what does a politician do one easy fix tell the businesses that are hogging the electricity that they can't get it from the grid anymore they got to get it from somewhere else right and so if you think about that what that means is we are going to have more power plants across the united states more infrastructure built across the united states um, and we're also going to see some of the things that fall from that. And that's what we actually want to talk about today. But there's something actually interesting if you look. Well, you talk about the idea of some of these massive jumps that we have. If you go the next kind of layer and you just look at percent changes here, what you can see is the very dark, dark yellows here. That's where you have a significant ramp in prices, right? Buffalo up 200%. Baltimore up 125% in terms of price for um, uh, price for power. But if you look, the blue dots, those blue dots are where you actually saw power prices um, not actually rise, but drop in the last few years. And what's really interesting is if you look at this, there seems to be a pattern here, right? One of the places that you could look at for the pattern here is, yeah, there's where battery backup is starting to build because we got clean energy. But there's another thing that if you really look at that, that chart, that chart also overlaps really well with where we have a lot of natural gas and oil, mm. um, in particular natural gas. Why? Because if you want to talk about how we're going to power the AI boom, be it on grid or pre grid, to your point, Joel, you're going to have to look at natural gas because any of the other solutions aren't there. And by the way, everybody seems to be on part of this story, right? There's stories, a narrative all over the place about how AI driven demand is causing gas turbines. Um, to be this phenomenal demand in terms of everybody's trying to buy as many as they can and people are in a race to get from 
the Siemens of the world, the um, the GE Vernovas of the world. And because of that, right, the stock prices for these companies, right, Siemens, GE Vernova, uh, Mitsubishi, these companies that basically make turbines, make um, uh, for uh, transformers and all this other stuff, they have taken off. I mean, Siemens is up almost 500% since uh, April 2024. Not even since ChatGPT was announced and then Sam Altman had his whole conversation about um, you know, at Microsoft about how we're going to need massive amounts of power. This is just in the last year and change, up 500%. GE Renova up 350%. Mitsubishi, right, a stodgy Japanese firm, up almost 200%. So people are starting to catch on to the idea here. And part of the reason why is because, look, the order book for natural gas turbines, right, for the turbines that help you run combined natural gas plants, clean natural gas energy, the, the demand in terms of the order book is off the charts, Right. Effectively, we have this, 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 what this chart shows you is that dotted line is what production levels are, how much natural gas turbines they can make across those three big players. Those black bar, bars, you can see they're massively over that. We have a huge demand. And quite frankly, 2020, 2030, the only reason why 2030 is down is because most people don't want to put in an order from five years from now. Wait a year and that bar will be as high as the other bars are right now. And right, this is why you're seeing things like Mitsubishi is talking about doubling turbine capacity as demand source. And so you might say, hey, doesn't that mean that we might we, we want to buy the companies that are making um, all of this equipment? Um, and we think that some of them are interesting, but here's the thing. So when you look at this, what this is, is on a uniform accounting basis, those dark blue bars are for the electrical equipment makers, right? Companies like GE Vernova. Um, where return on assets has been historically? It's historically been a 10 to 15% return on asset business. Those two light blue bars, that is what Wall Street is forecasting the return on assets for electrical equipment companies to be for the next two years. And the white bars, that's at current valuations, what the market says the return on assets has to be to make current values fair. Well, you can see the market kind of has already sniffed out for some of these companies that you are going to see this massive amount of demand and you're going to have a, a, a super cycle in demand for power equipment. But Joel... If you're gonna buy, if you're gonna build a lot of natural gas power plants, don't you not just need equipment? Isn't there something else you need to power those power plants? Yes, sir. You you might need everybody natural gas. And so if you look at natural gas, <laughs> this is that exact same kind of chart, but for natural gas companies. And what you can see is, look, the late 2010s were a terrible time for natural gas companies. We were over capacity and we basically saw demand pull back. But you can see on average, outside of those five years, return on assets for these businesses tends to average around 5% is what it has been when you're not in boom times, just average times. Well, the next two years, they're forecasted to be around 5%. These white bars are what the market is pricing natural gas to be in terms of natural gas prices in natural gas return on assets for the exploration production companies, the companies that actually pull it out of the ground and then sell it onto power plants to be able to, um, to, be able to power power plants. The market's basically saying, hey, yeah, we know you're going to build a bunch of natural gas power plants, but you're not really going to need that much more natural gas. Natural gas is still going to be a terrible investment. Of course, that doesn't make sense, everybody. And so it's really interesting is there is a, a really interesting opportunity in a dislocation here where the market is just not paying attention to the fact that natural gas, which, by the way, we're also now exporting with LNG um, to basically use as a, as a tool for our geopolitical power also, that we're going to have phenomenal boom times for natural gas. So, Joel, I don't know about you, but it seems to me that the market might be missing the picture here. Yeah, the, the whole value chain should have similar expectations in terms of the profitability because the whole value chain should should win but for whatever reason right now natural gas hasn't popped as much as the equipment makers that would use natural gas so we think there's an opportunity here and then look i still think you know companies like gia vernova the the expected returns are probably still too low given the demand right still too low given as much as a stock is done there probably still has a lot more room to run really but why is it leaving behind going one step up in the value chain? We, we ought to see these start to pick up also and soon. 
And so everybody, let's just look at two companies for as an example of what we're seeing here. So one of these companies is Range Resources. Range Resources is one of the largest um, natural gas. So we just focused on, so when you talk about exploration production companies, you know, they have oil ones, natural gas ones, ones with a mix of everything. So we just try to focus on where ones where natural gas makes more than 50, 40 to 50% of reserves in production to just be, you know, basically really look at natural gas. Well, if you look at range resources here, everybody, right? They had, when we had tight natural gas markets, if everybody remembers in 2022, because of what happened in the Ukraine war when Russia invaded, natural gas prices spiked right up to six, $7 in the US. And look at what happened to return on assets for uh, range resources. Well, analysts right now are forecasting that because of this boom that we're about to have in demand for natural gas because of power, that we're going to see return on assets bump up to towards 10% for range. But look at what the market's pricing in. The market's pricing in return on assets dropping for this business. This is the kind of story that we're seeing. We've got some companies that we think are really compelling that um, I'll talk about in a moment for this. But range is a great example of this. And another one is Murphy Oil. Murphy Oil, similarly, look at the spike on return on assets that you saw in 2022 when natural gas was tight, like we could see natural gas get tight again um, in the coming years. And yet, Wall Street is forecasting return on assets to be at low levels, and the market's barely pricing in a recovery, right? If we see return on assets rise back to cost of capital levels, you could have a huge amount of upside for Murphy or Range Resources, and there's a lot of other natural gas names just like this. Um, in fact, we actually just recently published a special report on this topic um, talking about the tightness that we are seeing in the energy market and the huge investment cycle we're about to see explode in across the energy ecosystem because of one, the AI, AI demand and two, what the government is doing to unlock all the natural resources we can do to power that. So if you want to actually hear about that, you can go to newenergyboom.com. The link is, you can read the link below, uh, below us on the screen here. N-E-W-E-N-E-R-G-Y boom.com. You can see our special report and we talk about some more companies that we think are compelling opportunities because of what's happening in the natural gas market and what's going to happen in the natural gas market. It's um, some great it's research our, yeah. and, and we, mm -hmm. we really flex our database um, you know, where we cover more than six, 7,000 U.S. companies. And so being able to dig in and find the ones that Wall Street's not yet talking about or maybe Wall Street's talking about but in the wrong way, um, that's where we cover it. So newenergyboom.com. Exactly. And so everybody, if you enjoyed this, drop it in the comments and let us know. Hit the like button and hit the subscribe button also. And that is this episode of Ultimate Authority. Thanks, everybody.